What's up everyone? Thanks for tuning in today. If you clicked on this lesson, you were probably hoping to hear a little bit of information about a really, really common standard that all of us as jazz musicians have learned at one point and probably played at countless jam sessions. Before we jump into that, I do just wanna take care of a little bit of business at the beginning of this video. First, I wanna thank everybody who has followed this channel over the last year, just recently got up over a thousand subscribers, so that is great. If you enjoy this content, please hit me up in the comments or drop me an email over at seanbellmusic.com and tell me ways that I can make this channel more useful for you as you sort of improve and grow on your jazz trombone and improvisation journey. Now, if you're watching this in the spring of 2021, when I first released this video, I'm actually gonna be taking a short hiatus from posting new content over the next several weeks. I am moving and that is gonna necessitate building a new studio teaching recording space at my new house. And that is gonna take a little while. So I probably won't be posting any new content until midway through the summer. Now, from now until then, Again, I'd really love to hear some suggestions from all of you about ways that I can improve this channel. As part of actually today's lesson, you'll see down in the description, you can click on a link to get a worksheet that accompanies the material we're gonna to cover today. It's gonna to have all of the sort of harmonic concepts, some musical examples, some licks that you can practice. Some of it will be written out in some different keys and just have sort of the material that we talk about today in a written worksheet format. If this is something that you find useful and you think, hey, I would really love to see this for future lessons, again, drop me a line let me know. I might consider adding this for all the lessons, but it does take a little bit of time in order to create those worksheets that kind of look nice and are useful for people. And I want to make sure I'm putting that time to good use rather than just sort of throwing it down a black hole of spending time on Sibelius. In the future, this sort of content might live on some sort of Patreon or some sort of platform like that. I'm not totally sure myself. I want to hear feedback from all of you to see if this is something that you think would be helpful as you practice through this stuff to see if it's something I want to invest time in. All right, with all that out of the way, let's dig into today's lesson. We're talking about the tune Blue Bassa. This is a must-know standard um, if you are trying to work on becoming a good improviser, sort of in the jazz idiom. It's a very common tune that many sort of beginner and intermediate players work on, and it actually has some great concepts that all of us as jazz musicians could work on. I think it's one that's thought of as a like overplayed tune at jam sessions and on gigs because it's sort of easy meaning that it doesn't have a lot of different key centers. Um, certainly all tunes have their challenges, but this tune really mostly hangs out in C minor and then for a little bit in D flat. So it doesn't require a ton of harmonic information to be able to navigate successfully. Now, let's look at an example of me playing just a chorus of this to kind of establish a baseline of what we're talking about on this tune. So here we go. Here's just a single chorus of me improvising on Bubasa. Now that we know where we're starting from, we might want to think, well, Sean, why is this video called a practice blueprint? Are we going to talk about every single little nut and bolt and nook and cranny of how to play Bubasa? No, we're certainly not going to. That lesson would take hours, um, potentially. There's a lot of material you could work on to play this tune successfully. We're just going to talk about a handful of concepts that I like to practice on this sort of tune, and I like my students to practice on this sort of tune in order to help them be successful particularly on songs that have kind of like functional chords in minor keys. One, four, two, five, that type of stuff in a minor key. Before we jump into these couple concepts that we're going to cover today, the only thing we're not gonna to focus too much on is kind of how we work arpeggios through these changes in order to like outline the chords. If you do want a little more information, I would really encourage you to go back on the channel and check out the two lessons that are called, I Learned the Modes, Why Do I Still Suck? Those really outline how to practice arpeggios through, again, sort of like two, five, one driven tunes to help you develop that part of your playing. That's a really important thing, but we're just not gonna talk about that today. You certainly should practice that on Bubasa, but uh, it's not gonna be the main focus of what we discussed today. So if you want that information, go check out those other videos because um, it is really important. Cool, concept number one that we're gonna worry about for playing this sort of tune is that we really wanna have good command over playing pentatonic scales and building melodies with pentatonic scales. There are many ways that you could use pentatonic scales 
in both sort of like super functional ways that they really relate to the chord and maybe somewhat less functional ways that are going to allow you to actually stretch the harmony a little bit. We're going to mostly focus on the first one of those two, the functional ways or the most typical ways that we use pentatonics. To start with, we want to think about the pentatonics we could use on this tune. Now, we have a variety of key centers here, but we're mostly going to think on three pentatonic scales, the C minor pentatonic, the F minor pentatonic, and the D flat major pentatonic scale. So let's check out what each one of those scales sounds like. This may be information you're already familiar with, but if you're not, this is really important to check out. Okay, we have two different flavors of a pentatonic scale here. We have a minor pentatonic for C and F that is built off of the root, the flat third, the fourth, the fifth, the flat seven, and the root for each one of those keys. And then we also have a major pentatonic for D flat. And we're building that off of the root, the nine, or the second, the major third, the fifth, the sixth, and the root again. The question might be, where do we apply these? The first two, the minor chords, I think are pretty apparent. We're gonna apply those on the minor chords. So when we see a C minor chord, we're gonna think, all right, I can build melodies based off of this C minor pentatonic scale. Same thing for F minor. Now, I don't necessarily always like students to think about, uh, I'm just strictly gonna use pentatonic scales when I have a minor two five. Uh, one scale is not gonna work so effectively over that entire chunk. And a lot of times when we use these pentatonics, we're trying to think over top of the chord changes rather than like really laying it down, hitting each chord tone like we might if we're doing arpeggios, for example. So there, we're just gonna rest or we're not gonna think pentatonic melodies. We might use some other device to navigate through those two bars. Now, when I get to the D flat section of this tune where I have a two, five, one to D flat major, there I actually can think about the pentatonic scale across that entire four bars. However, I would caution you to just be thoughtful about how you choose chord tones on that two, five, one section. For example, on the A flat dominant seventh chord, if you hang out on a big juicy D flat through that entire chord, even though that entire section is kind of in D flat major, it is gonna sound relatively dissonant or just that it wants to resolve. It's not going to sound bad, quote unquote. I think too often we think it sounds bad when we play the fourth on a dominant chord. It's just that it wants to resolve. So we don't want that just to sort of hang out there. We want that note to resolve to the C, maybe up to the E flat. Um, and that is what is gonna drive our melody forward. So when you're trying to apply these over a bigger chunk of the tune, four bars, especially where there are several chords, you're just gonna have to be really thoughtful about how you choose what notes you're going to land on. But when you're building the melody, that can sound great over those four bars where we just think of that one scale to choose our notes. Let's listen to what this would sound like if I'm using sort of this like base level of pentatonic application where I'm really thinking about probably the first avenue I would go for each one of these chords. All right, great. What if we wanted to stretch this pentatonic knowledge just a little bit? We could actually think about starting on the fifth of each one of these chords or key centers and building the pentatonic scale from there. That would give us some different color choices, maybe help us find some different melody shapes in these scales. So for C, I'm gonna build a pentatonic off of the G, still a minor pentatonic. So it's gonna be a G, a B flat, a C, a D, an F, and a G. Now I can do that same thing off of my next two scales. So when I go to F minor seven chord, I'm gonna think of a pentatonic based off of C. Or when I go to this D flat major chord section, I'm gonna make that pentatonic scale based off of A flat. I'm gonna play my A flat major pentatonic. Now clearly all these scales you should actually practice kind of across your entire range. I'm just playing them in one octave just to demonstrate. But this is gonna allow you to access some sort of different areas of the harmony, can think of some melodies that land on some different color tones, um, which is gonna give just a nice variety to this sort of pentatonic approach. Let's hear a chorus of that approach and just see how that changes the melody shapes that I choose.
Cool. So pentatonic scales are a huge area that you can practice as an improviser. They're incredibly flexible, and there's actually a lot of interesting ways you can sort of get in and out of the harmony using these scales. Maybe we'll do a lesson on that in the future. But for now, let's just think about those two things, off of the root and off of the fifth, and that can give you a ton of mileage on a tune like this, or really any tune that has sort of longer chunks of chords. All right, let's jump into the next concept that I think is important for students and professional players for that matter to practice on this sort of tune. That is trying to develop your 251 vocabulary. As with many standards, 251s are sort of the foundation of a lot of the harmony we use as jazz musicians, as improvisers. That is just the language of the material that we play. So we want to be able to have lots of ways to navigate through that little nugget of harmony in sort of smooth, interesting, varied ways. So there are a couple two fives in here, so this is a great place to work on some. Let's look at just two examples of some two fives here. Let's look at a long two five that fits into our two key centers. Now, one is a minor two five and one is a major two five, so I'm gonna have to change them very slightly, but I won't get too hung up on that. For the most part, it's just changing that one note that is in the arpeggio. Let's check it out. <laughs> Pretty meat and potatoes here. I arpeggiate down through the two chord, back up, resolve to the third of the five chord, and then I play down to the altered scale, starting on the flat 13. So it just gives me some nice tension that eventually resolves. Now, if I want to play a short two five, let's look at one of those examples. <laughs> Again, I had to change it subtly because of the minor seven flat five versus just the straight up minor chord when I'm in D flat major. So again, relatively straightforward, mostly arpeggio based. Again, resolving to the third on the five chord, that's classic voice leading on these two fives. And then I do the little flat 13 resolving to nine. Again, a very common gesture. These are by no means the world's most creative or out of the box two fives. These are something that all jazz musicians play, but that's where we want to start when we're building this vocabulary is really developing that language. And from there, we can find more interesting ways to navigate through these chords. So the way we practice this, there's a couple ways you could go. Um, I'm a big believer in really kind of putting the blinders on when we work on this sort of material and really trying to work on plugging into fives. And that's just what we're going to do here. I'll play through one chorus of Bubasa. I'm going to continue to think sort of like pentatonic-ish on the places that are not two fives, since we're talking about that concept in this lesson. And then when I get to those two fives, I'm going to really make sure that I plug that in, even to the point where I'm going to sit there and wait for it to come around. If you've never practiced in this way, this is going to feel like super in a box. And that's okay. That's what we got to do in order to gain good mastery over this material. And if you feel like this is difficult to improvise around it, just start by resting. So for example, you might rest through the first four bars and then plug that two five in, resolve the C minor. Rest again, plug the two five in on the two five to uh, D flat major. So let's check that out what this sounds like. I'm going to use the long two fives for the minor two fives. So when I go to C, I'm going to play a long two five. And then when I go to D flat, I'm going to play that short one just so I can get both of them in there in this example. Let's check it out. Now, those two concepts, playing pentatonic melodies and playing two fives and navigating those two fives, if you just gain good command over those two things, you will sound good on 75% of jazz tunes that are out there. This is really the meat and potatoes of being a good improviser, is being able to make these straightforward melodies using a pentatonic scale, maybe even just using the major scale. And then when we get to two fives or other sort of dominant sections that resolve having good ways to navigate through those, that is the real deal of how to become a good improviser. Now, if you do want to take it one step further on this type of tune, or particularly any tune that has sort of longer chunks of chords, um, you can think about this next concept. And this is playing diatonic triads, or what we might call triad pairs, depending on how you slice this information. So let's look at what this actually means. 
Any of our scales, or modes for that matter, we can split into diatonic triads. Just means that we're building triads from the different notes in the scale that stay inside that key. So if we were playing in C minor, so C Dorian, I'm gonna build triads above each one of those notes in the scale, and I'm only going to use notes from that scale. So it would sound like this. This is a pretty run-of-the-mill way of working on our scales. However, we can turn that into some really interesting melodic ideas if we sort of break that up, maybe start in different places of the scale, maybe change direction, all that type of stuff. So let's kind of break down how we actually do that. So we're gonna start on our C minor chord, and we're just gonna think about the ones that fit on C minor. You could actually do this through all of the keys in this tune, but we're just gonna use C minor as an example. So let's look at just a couple of the arpeggios that fit there. I'm gonna start on the high G and work my way down diatonically. In this case, we can see that connects really nice to my F minor seven chord. And I happen to actually choose starting on G so it would connect in a nice smooth melodic way. That still sounds pretty dry. What if we put a little bit of rhythm onto that and just a little bit of variation in that way so it sounds a little bit more like an idiomatic jazz idea. Suddenly that doesn't really sound like I'm just playing a scale exercise, it sounds like I'm playing a nice melody that sort of uses this structure of these descending chords as sort of the foundation of it. And that's really, I think, what we're looking for when we think about this approach, where we're superimposing the different chords on top of these minor chords in this case. So that's if I just started from the fifth, that would be a great place to start. Do that in all the keys and you'll be able to apply that and it'll be a, a nice thing to add your vocabulary that is different than pentatonic scales, different than two fives, it kind of has its own sound. What if we want to change that up? What if I start from the third of each chord? I play three, five root, that same kind of descending pattern, um, but just change kind of the way I move through each chord. Again, I just get a really nice melody shape that sounds totally different than the first one um, because since I'm moving differently through those chords, it sort of like changes where the articulation and the accents sort of lie. Now, if you want to go one step further, you can start to add some approach notes to these triads. And so when we talk about an approach note, if, uh, for example, my first triad is that C minor chord, I'm going to approach my first note I play, the G, by a half step. And I'm going to do that possibly through each chord that I move through. Now, clearly there, I start to really get some non-harmonic tones in this line. For example, I start in an F sharp, not in the chord. I have an E natural on the downbeat of three, at least in the example I just played. Uh, also not in the chord. I have a C sharp later on. So this is going to give your lines, again, some tension, some release. That's going to help them pro be propelled forward and just make them a little bit more interesting. Now, if I kind of throw all that into a pile, combine these approach notes, combine possibly changing direction, combine different rhythms, it's really going to sound like an interesting, angular, just sort of different take on how to play through these changes. Even though I was still just playing those diatonic triads, I mixed some approach notes in, sometimes I didn't use them, I used a different rhythm, that sort of changed where some of that resolution happened. For example, when I got to the F minor chord, I actually didn't resolve to that F minor triad until the end of two, or excuse me, the end of one, instead of being on the beat. Now when I'm actually playing, I'm not really thinking about this. I've practiced all this stuff a lot in a vacuum, you know, kind of outside of the context of music. So when I go to play, I'm hopefully just hearing these lines and I'm not even necessarily thinking so much about, am I gonna resolve on the downbeat? I'm just sort of hearing my way through it. And when I start to reach that resolution point, I might just sort of pivot when I need to in order to resolve in the place that my ear is hearing. Let's check out what it would sound like if I sort of apply all these sort of diatonic triad concepts in a chorus. Um, now again, on those two fives, I'm not maybe gonna use this as much, especially on the minor two five. It's just gonna be a little trickier to navigate smoothly through some chords that are gonna fit there. On the major two five, you actually can apply things that sort of fit on D flat major, the diatonic triads for D flat major, along with possibly some other triads in there. Um, it can really sound effective. So let's see what that would sound like. Bye. 
Okay, cool. Now, the only thing we haven't talked about today is the most important thing on this tune or any other tune, and that is listening and transcribing. I cannot overemphasize how much this will make a difference in your playing if this is something you don't do on an incredibly regular basis. All of these concepts that we talked about today are all great and everything, but they should really be there to help us understand what we listen to in the greats playing and maybe take some of the ideas that the greats have played, that tradition, and build upon it. Um, for me, the recordings to check out on this tune, Kenny Dorham on page one. That's got to be where you start. Uh, for my money, I think that's the first recorded example of this tune. There might be a Kenny Dorham album that has it on there that was recorded a little bit earlier, but Kenny Dorham wrote this tune, and this is where that tune originates from. That is a Joe Henderson album that Kenny Dorham is a sideman on, so that is page one. The other one that I really love students to check out from a transcription standpoint is a Dexter Gordon recording of this on the album Biting the Apple. Um, he plays a number of great choruses that are just classic sort of straight ahead um, change playing on a minor tune like this where he really deals with many of these concepts, pentatonic melodies, hitting those two fives, all that type of stuff. So that's a really great one and actually pretty transcribable by most instruments. I have trombone students transcribe this one. Some of it you might have to alter a little bit or um, you, know, you might not be able to play every single lick um, at full tempo, but that's okay. Uh, you can get a pretty big percentage of that solo. And then the last one that I really love is a JJ solo on the album Quintergy. That's Live at the Village Vanguard Quintergy. That's kind of a double album-ish. Um, it was released as two albums. There's one that's called Live at the Village Vanguard Standards and one that's called Quintergy. Quintergy is really difficult to find. I don't think it's on Spotify or Apple Music or any of those things. You'd have to actually like go and buy like a CD or um, an LP of it. Um, but that's actually one of the first solos I ever transcribed was JJ playing Blue Bassa on that recording. They do it with kind of like a little bit of a funkier bass line, kind of a different take on this tune. All right, great. I hope you enjoyed this type of lesson. And like I said, click down in the description to get the worksheet that has all this stuff sort of spelled out in an organized way. So if you're looking to practice some of this material, hopefully that will be a good practice companion for you. And if you enjoy that type of content, let me know down in the comments, hit me up with an email. Um, like I said, I'm toying around with doing a little bit more of that, but I wanna make sure it's something that would be useful for all of you viewing this. All right, we'll see you in the woodshed.